Hello and welcome to Digital Leaders TV, the live discussion show where we enlist the help of experts to get under the skin of some of the most important areas of technology and digital transformation for today's digital leaders. My name is Kate Russell and today we are taking on one of the most important and challenging topics in the digital world, cyber security. I facilitated the Intel Cybersecurity Summit last week in London, where the Minister for State at the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, Ed Vasey, announced the cybersecurity health check for businesses across the UK. Now, shockingly, we learned at that summit that the number of global threats has skyrocketed over the past 10 years, from 25 threats per day in 2005 to almost half a million threats a day this year. Layer on top of that, the fact that we are currently around a million unfilled jobs in cybersecurity around the world, and we have a virtual time bomb ticking away if we don't start to act now. On the plus side, we also heard from the DCMS that Britain is the sixth largest exporter of cybersecurity skills and resources in the world. So there are some tremendous opportunities too. Well, to help us hack through the facts uh, with some solid advice we've enlisted some excellent experts with me in the studio today is Edward Lewis he is a senior editor at The Economist an expert in energy intelligence and cybersecurity issues Jennifer Akuri is founder of the InnoTech Network a platform of high-profile bespoke events and videos designed to advance tech policy by bridging the gap between policymakers investors and entrepreneurs and Adam, Dr. Adam Beaumont, who is CEO and founder of AQL, uh, both a scientist and an engineer. Adam is a consistent innovator working on the cutting edge of mobile communications technology. So no shortage of expertise there. And during the next 40 minutes or so, we'll be inviting you to put your questions and comments to the panel by tweeting at DigiLeaders with the hashtag DigiLeaders. The information is there all you need to know um, or you can use the chat function in the Google Hangout broadcast if you're watching us live through Google Hangouts um, but before we do that I want to give our guest as usual the chance to put forward their position on the issues at hand so Edward please uh, tell us where you stand on cybersecurity well hello and thanks very much indeed for having me um, I've just written this book called um, Cyberphobia um, which I spent a few years researching and as I went on researching the book I got more and more scared and in the gap between submitting the manuscript and it coming out I've become even more worried. It seems to me that the internet was not designed to be the central nervous system of modern life. It's never had security as a priority. We've always put convenience and low cost and innovation as being more important and now we face a really big problem even if we started doing the right thing right now we would have a huge lump of legacy systems um, which would be burdening and uh, us and making our security vulnerable. I think we actually know what to do. The answers in cybersecurity are there in terms of identity assurance, defense in depth, making sure that uh, your data is properly encrypted. Uh, the problem is getting people to do this stuff. It's much more a human problem now than a technical one. And I think we're really grappling for answers there. We've got to address it a bit like road safety. We didn't make road safe in this country with a magic bullet. It took a lot of time, everything from insurance companies through to car manufacturers to local politicians and officials designing the road better, um, driver education, can't click every kit trip, speed kills, um, don't drink and drive and I think we've got to look at cybersecurity in the same way and attack it from every direction but one thing I'm certain it's going to get worse before it gets better because we've got so many problems um, that are already in effect irreparable and that's before we even start with things like the Internet of Things which I think is going to make things worse not better. Yeah. Yes, some sobering um, points there are definitely and things that we're going to um, really get our teeth into chatting through over the next 40 minutes or so. Um, uh, Jennifer, please introduce uh, yourself and where you stand on the issues. Hello, uh, thank you so much for having me on here. My name is Jennifer R. Curie. I run InnoTech, but I also have become a certified ethical hacker and certified penetration tester myself. Uh, for the last year and a half, I've been running these hack nights. Uh, they're called Hack That, where I kind of bring together all these different skills within cybersecurity and we've run different red and blue team incident response drills, we've hacked different sites, we've built platforms, we're working on a capture the flag platform for Hacker House 
Um, I've also read Cyberphobia. I thought it was amazing because, you know, Edward Lucas puts it right on the head there. It is a human problem. We are dealing with a human cognitive behavioral problem. Um, I open every one of my event series with this perfect example from Alfred, um, Albert Einstein where he says that the definition of crazy is to do the same thing over and over again expecting a different answer. And when I read his book and as I continue my own journey of becoming a hacker, um, or now that I am one, I, I see the truth in that more so than ever. And when you walk around these major trade shows and they try to sell you another piece of tech or encryption service where really it comes down to you know basic awareness and I love the idea of treating security as you would you know a population to stop smoking or legislating awareness through education I think we should be educating kids behind a wheel of a car the same way we would if you get on surf on the internet so a big um, premise to my approach with launching Hacker House is being able to teach awareness in education but also to aggregate skill that can actually drive you know solutions um, I've been hacked 17 times in the last four months it's been awful I know what it's like to have your details and your identity stolen I still have to fight to make sure that there's nobody compromising my computers and mobile devices I care so passionately about this I've become obsessed and I've actually launched a new RFID protected Faraday line um, called Faraday Pro and Faraday Girl a backpack for girls and a professional bag for men and women as they travel around the city because I don't think the awareness is there yet on just how easy it is to steal someone's identity so I you know I run my events but I'm I am a full full-on hacker and ready to um, change this landscape with people like you so thank you so much for having me Perfect, brilliant. Um, and finally, um, Adam, um, your your position and context, please. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Um, so, yeah, where where do I start, really? Um, cyber cyber has got um, far more all encompassing, far more important over the last few years, and the number of attack vectors has increased significantly. Significantly, I mean, the the the, the main different um, ways of looking at cyber are privacy, integrity, and also availability. So if somebody wants to take you out as a person or as a, as a company, uh, take you offline, cause you problems, um, they, they can affect the availability of, of the services that are provided to you. Um, they can make you not trust those services by violating your privacy, or they can make you not trust the data that you're reading by affecting its integrity. All these are different ways of undermining how we use uh, how we use the internet, how we use our own digital systems, and the challenge is uh, it is a human one, um, and it is something that that needs to be um, echoed from the board down, and that's that's very very important. And and our company is lucky because my back, my background is internet security, penetration testing, and I happen to be the CEO, so that's kind of a, the default position for our company, but. Knowing um, or seeing many other technology companies, that isn't the default position. And the challenge is to work out what should you be doing, what should, what does good look like, um, and that's that's a conversation we've been having over and over again. And although um, there is a, a multitude of hack attempts to the point where now it has to be uh, dealt with heuristically uh, because there's too many for humans to get involved with, there's still best practice that needs to be learned. And the cyber essential scheme is one way. Um, but there's also something uh, we're involved with, uh, which is an initiative by CERT UK, which is called the Cyber Information Sharing Partnership. And this is actually divided into regions, not because cyber is regional, but because people are. And it is a people problem. So this gets people together and also gets different organizations, small and large, and the larger organizations with more of a CIO function to be able to share best practice across a secure platform with smaller organizations. And so that, that initiative is called CISP, C-I-S-P, Cyber Information Sharing Partnership. And if anybody's interested in it, they should go to cisp.org.uk, sign up, um, put AQR down as sponsor organization, and that, that should get you through. 
Perfect. Thank you so much. Well, you know, as you can see, uh, we've got, you know, the perfect experts to try and chew through the fat of some of the thornier issues here. Um, you know, and, and I apologize in advance to our audience because we're probably going to put the fear of God into you uh, in the next 40 minutes. But in some ways, that is a good thing because we cannot be too complacent when it comes to not only our business security, but also our own personal security. Um, the first point of discussion I'd like to talk about is the changing landscape of threats. Uh, you know, security has never been more important. With a move to the cloud becoming pretty much an imperative for competitive businesses today, um, and the delivery of enhanced customers' experiences, which customers expect. Today's digital security threats are more sophisticated and complex than ever. Um, but at the same time, computing adva advancements are opening up new possibilities for exploring, connecting, sharing, and building a better world. So we can't close the door on the cyber world because there are so many opportunities. Um, the first question then really is to all of our panel, how do you think of the most fundamental ways that today's threats, uh, the, the threats that businesses face today, how has that changed over the last decade? You know, we heard that shocking statistic from 25 threats a day to half a million threats a day. Jennifer, let's start with you. Um, you know, as somebody who sort of like experiences trying to get into um, people's uh, weaknesses uh, in an ethical way. Um, how do you think are the, the, the main changes uh, transpiring? Well, I always give the example of as your brakes of your car connect to your smartphone, to your smart handbag, to the smart water bottle, as the Internet of Things continues to escalate, you're going to see more and more vulnerabilities created. I mean, right now, one computer is 65,535 ports, right? And then if you, every time you port scan to check what vulnerabilities need to be updated, you're going to create more and more layers that then become... Uh, more of a liability for the average person to take care of. So, I mean, this is where the escalation of threats is like the basic Internet of Things, problem number one. Number two, your passwords. I mean, people get really annoyed with this, but changing your password every two months or every couple of weeks uh, is, is absolutely essential because these programs get more and more sophisticated every day. And there's like buying and selling, like active buy and, buying and selling of pass, passwords online. So we have to constantly be thinking ahead. And the people that keep one password across the board, I mean, this comes from a girl whose password used to be let me in, like, for everything. So, you know, it's it's just about being aware and, and, and slowly adapting your life, you know, to that. Well, you mentioned port scans, though. You know, do, do you think the average computer users, user in business even knows how to do a port scan? I know. No. I mean, I didn't know what that was. And the first time I scan my own computer, I find 27 open ports and I freak out like, oh, no, you know, but the reality is we need some open ports. That's what email is for. And a lot of different applications utilize um, those different communication ports. But, you know, think of it like updating your browser. You know how annoying it is when the Apple or, you know, Mozilla with Firefox sends you an update. Um, that's kind of what patching your own system is like. And right now, I guess the bit of, the bit that I always try to stress is we live in a very port-driven society. So one computer with 65,000 ports, one smartphone with a bunch of ports. But eventually, once the Internet of Things kind of continues to take shape, everything manufactured will be smart. So you're going to have layers and layers and la you're going to be your own telecoms company, you know, walking around like your own orange. O2, Verizon, I mean, it's it's crazy how, you know, and this can't be a government liability, they'll never be able to keep up with that. And it can't be a corporate thing because we give away the farm to corporates, we just don't realize how much information we share. So it has to be a personal um, journey, you know, of understanding how to not only keep your identity in check, but to also make sure all your devices are safe. And this is what I'm constantly trying to teach. And Edward, you know, I'm I'm sensing from your introduction and the, you know the content um, of your book that you're in agreement that it is a it's a people issue. Um, how do you think the changes? Um, you know, what what have been the major changes that businesses are facing? I think the first thing is that the the attack surface has got so much bigger. You know, 10, 15 years ago, compute businesses weren't so dependent 
on networks. They might have computers they use for word processing, something like that. The idea now that you have a website that is integrated into your stock control and your invoicing and so on, this is something that's really hard for people to visualize. And I think visualization of the threat is a real problem. Evolution hasn't designed us to uh, be able to see and understand these sort of threats, which are ubiquitous, pervasive, invisible. We think about security in terms of locks and keys and someone coming into our house and us you know, and catching them and putting them in jail. And that's not the way um, cybersecurity works. So I think that that's one huge problem. I think another one is the insider threat, that you are dependent on the weakest link if your network is badly designed. And you, it's really easy to fool people into clicking on attachments and clicking on links. And this is, for most um, cybercrime, that's, it's as simple as that. It's an automated phishing email. Thousands of them go out. Maybe they'll be carefully designed with use of the sort of data that we leave on LinkedIn and so on. But yeah, the bog standard email, which I had one today from the editor of a very important magazine, which I won't mention. And it had a classic um, thing saying, please take a look. And then you, I ran it. And, Sandbox, so it was all safe, and it was uh, it was it wanted my uh, log into your email and gave all the main emails with their logos, and I emailed to him because I thought maybe he can see his email and said some of your emails have been compromised and uh, sending out dangerous malware, and got a message back saying no, this email is legit, you can open it. But I knew that wasn't for him because I just phoned him up and he said I can't get into my email, and that's an editor of a pretty important magazine. People are going to read his emails. If he sends them something, they're going to open them. So this this human factor is just so important. And how do you train people not to do um, these kind of basic things? Um, so I think that, that, that to me is the most important thing. And I don't know how we're going to get around that in the short term because we're just not scared enough. We're not hurting it. It's only when people say, my job's on the line. I could, you know, I'm a director of a company. I could go to jail for this in the same way I could go to jail for fraudulent accounting. Then people may be going to take notice, but we just aren't there yet. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Adam, what do, you, what, what do you have to add? I guess it's the unknown, really. I mean, uh, so Jennifer said uh, she she knew she'd been hacked 17 times, for example, uh, over the previous however many days. Um, that's those are the hacks. Hold on. Okay, those, those are the hacks that that, uh, that you know about as an informed person. Um, a lot of a lot of compromises of people's um, systems, whether it's their computer or their company systems, go unnoticed. And some of those hackers are more organized. They, they aren't after the short-term win. So there's a lot of companies, a lot of individuals that sit there and say, I'm secure, we don't have a problem, our systems haven't gone down, um, we haven't experienced any problems, but actually they're already compromised, uh, the attackers are already in, and, and they've been in for days, weeks, and sometimes years. And they wait until they see something that's of interest. And one of the biggest risks um, that we face at the moment is intellectual property theft. So this is when you work really, really hard as a business. Um, you keep all your experiments, all your findings on your company systems. And suddenly, somebody else has the same innovation as you over the other side of the world. And you don't know why. And you don't know how it happened. So it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the unknown that's, that's the real problem. And the, the, way, the way that we need to approach that is to reward it. So imagine, for example, uh, somebody broke into your house um, and messed around um, with, uh, I don't know, the, your kitchen and what have you, you'd, you'd feel compromised and, and violated. And if, for example, because you don't, it's the fear of the unknown, so for example, you don't know if they've been in your bathroom, whether they've touched your toothbrush or whatever, um, but if you have that granular audit layer of who's accessed every piece of data, has that piece of data been changed, can you trust the system, can you actually see the scope of the problem, then, then you can actually, uh, you can recover from those kind of issues much quicker, and more importantly, you can also tell any stakeholders what's happened, and you can actually tell them the limit to the, the extent of the damage, so that they can manage it downstream, and that's, that's one of the, the, the ongoing challenges we all have to face, is that sooner or later we are going to have an incident and the more we know, the more we're empowered to reassure those that we've done the best thing we can. 
But Adam, you know, I mean, we're talking about you know securing your uh, your your, um, your system, securing your network um, uh, from break-ins, and there is a tendency for us to think that uh, cyber criminals are getting more sophisticated. But actually, you know, there are many automation tools now that are uh, meaning it's you can literally buy ransomware. Uh, you know, there are even um, organisations offering a a ten percent profit share basis, so you don't even need to buy it. It's like ransomware on demand. Um, mm. Now the other thing that, that that you know is is happening more and more is not just internal um, uh, you know break-ins and people wanting to do stuff internally, but if they can't get into your system, they can easily go to a Czechoslovakian website to spoof your email address and and cause problems for your business by pretending to be you in a damaging way. You know, it it seems to me that that that, that there's pretty much nothing you can do about that kind of attack. Um, well. You, you, there, there are things you can do. Um, so, um, spoofed email, for example, um, there is intelligence now within mail servers uh, which will actually only accept certain domains, so your name at a domain, from certain IP addresses of certain servers. So, there is, there is integrity checking that can happen. Um, and these are starting to be adopted as best practice by your internet service providers. Um, there's also um, DNS security, uh, which signs DNS requests to say that this DNS request is bona fide, so the namespace within the internet can't be spoofed as easily. Um, and there's also integrity checking more so uh, now uh, in the BGP routing domain, which is actually the core fabric of the internet, which is deciding what data path data travels along. So there's a lot of work being done in the background um, to manage some of the, the core underlying infrastructure um, so that it is harder to, to do those, those simple kinds of spoofs. But you're right, there are, there are tools that, that, that can be used um, by both sides um, to, to, to either to, to exploit or to protect. So simple tools, for example, like Nessus um, with a full evolved um, suite of plugins, you can launch that against your own systems and it will give you what is quite an insightful report um, which can be interpreted pretty much by the layperson as, do I have a problem, am I likely to have a problem or not? Um, but the challenge is, is that if you do go onto the dark web, you can pretty much custom commission um, a, 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 an attack against an organization and it can, it can be tailored um, in, a, in a way that's specific, that's only, it's only limited by the amount of money that you wish to pay um, the organization that's going to put it together for you. So, so really, if somebody wants to compromise your system and they have enough money, then there is usually a way, sadly. Presumably people can go to the CISP site and that's the kind of place they'll learn about those kind of solutions. Uh, Jennifer, you wanted to add something to that? I was going to say, well, 90% of the like average hack um, is automated. Yeah, but when you, the problem that Edward talks about in his book, but then, you know, and we talked about the human uh, cognitive problem. When you are targeted, that's where you're screwed. When someone says you, like I, it wasn't just coincidence that I was hacked over 17 times. That's because, I mean, that's part of the price you pay when you deal with hackers and you're working. You make with, yourself a target, right? Yeah, you, know, you make yourself profile. But like, I mean, and it, I'm not excusing it by any means, but also it, it forced me to A, learn what a shell was on my website and make sure that I had two-factor authentication and to get pay, you know, whatever I had to pay for for secure servers. Now I know exactly what a rootkit is. I know exactly how to make sure, you know, I can scan my site. Um, and, you know, the other really scary thing is that it's, it's the average uh, for a company to figure out they've been compromised is like 225 days. I can't remember where I've read that, so don't quote me exactly, but it's, it is around this kind of high insane number where you're like, that's a better part of a year. And I felt extremely violated because it wasn't until June I realized there was a, you know, elite shell on my computer. Like, how long was that there? And then now, I mean, every day we had to kind of rewrite the script on, on, the, on my basic, you know, uh, jenniferrcurie.com to kind of figure out, wait a minute, there was a lot more going on there than I, you know, was ever aware. And that kind of stuff, I mean, imagine if I was a Fortune 500 company and I had a bunch of credit cards. And so I absolutely think there, there needs
needs to be more accountability, and this could this leads us into the you know next phase of the conversation. I you know where where do we who do who is responsible or who do we blame or is it the small businesses? Does everybody need to have a security officer? Well, maybe not, but they definitely, definitely need to take responsibility for the security of their their assets, the IP of the data that they uh, that they hold, but also the information they're collecting from outside sources. I mean, there's more of an incentive now for me ever than before uh, to make sure that everybody that attends my events, you know, that I keep those lists. Whereas before, I I didn't really pay attention to who signed up, where they came from, and you know, who wanted to have access. To my database, but now I have to have accountability because it's the worst feeling to feel that somebody else is going behind you and taking stuff without you knowing. Absolutely, Edward. I mean, you know, it seems to me that the problem isn't is as you said is is only going to get worse. You know, around ninety percent of companies already use third-party commercial apps, um, and a report from Gartner last year actually said that seventy-five percent of mobile apps will fail security tests through the end of this year. Um, but businesses, you know, they almost can't survive without embracing uh, bring your own device now, and you know, and it, it has to be an integral part. So. Where is the where is the line drawn between you know threat and and the freedom to be able to actually get your your business moving forwards? Well, I think you're absolutely right that BYOD, bring your own device, is potentially a huge problem for companies. And I mean, it's a sort of rough analogy. If you stop using company cars and allowed everybody to use their own car, then the car does something bad who's to blame um, so we, we kind of familiar a bit with this problem from 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 previous life but the, the we, we are so used to our mobile devices being in effect our identity you know we give our mobile number out and that's kind of me and we expect that text messages are real and so we're perhaps even more vulnerable um, to uh, the, the sort of attacks you can get on mobiles than we are to ones on our desktops. We just, you know, our desktop is just there when we're at work. Our mobile we carry around everywhere. Some, you know, some people even check them, check them in, in bed. And, but I think that it was a very good point that you, we, we mustn't conflate the two different kinds of attacks. It's the bog standard automated attack, which is just trying to get some money. And that's actually quite easy to deal with because it um, doesn't involve this is not an APT, an advanced persistent threat. This is not some kind of brilliant Russian or Chinese geeks doing sort of really clever GCHQ stuff. Um, it's it's the equivalent of pickpockets. It's the equivalent of people who go to your door, ring on your doorbell, and say, "Can I have a glass of water?" And then um, when they come in, try and steal whatever they can see. So I think that you know, we we must be careful not to scare people. And if they think this is like the Bourne identity, and they're Jason Bourne, and you know, they're, they're, you know they're, they're some nameless, huge expert threat is out to get to them, they become kind of paralysed, and they just think, well, what, you know, what can I do? Let's just shut my, just shut my eyes and hope it doesn't come to me. And if you say to them, this is basically kind of automated pickpocketing, so keep your wallet zip in, in a zipped pocket, that sort of stuff people understand. I think there's a separate question when it comes to companies that have really valuable stuff, like you know, intellectual property, which can be what was referred to earlier, stuff you've invented. It can also just be commercial sensitive information about, for example, what you're going to announce tomorrow in a press release, which might be going to move your share price, or in the case of a newspaper or magazine, maybe stuff you're going to print tomorrow, which will move, move the markets. And, and dealing with these targeted threats is, is a lot more difficult. Um, and I think there you've really got to work with, work with the boards and have someone on the board who really understands this stuff and thinks, what are we actually trying to protect? This is not just like having a good reception guy who doesn't let people who doesn't let people in and out of the building without a good reason. You know, we're dealing with, 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 with a serious high-end threat. And then having the authority to bake in security all through the organization. And that's very difficult. The sort of people we need to do that just don't exist yet. The sort of you know, someone who can sit in a board meeting in a big company and talk with authority and expertise in a way that the other board members understand. I don't know where yeah. you find those people yet. That's the, that's key as well, you know, in a way that the other board member, members can understand. Um, moves us nicely onto our second discussion point: IT issue or business risk. Uh, now, many organisations say accept that cyber security, cyber security is a big business risk rather than an IT issue, um, but not many act on this. Um, you know, and, and also when it comes to to SMEs, you know, I know a lot of SMEs um, who don't have a dedicated CIO. So, you know, when you don't have somebody on the board who really understands inherently the problems and that it's not just IT, Edward, you know, what's the answer? Well, I think that you've touched on a very important thing that so far 
IT is seen as a cost. And the IT department comes to the company every now and again and says, we need to spend, and they come up with a long list of gobb gobbledygook. And the board then says, do we only have to have it? Why is this going to benefit our customers? Why do we need it? And they'll try and say, well, can you do half this year and half next year? And so on. It's, it doesn't, it, it's, it's not seen as something that's crucial to the survival of the company. And I think the key here is to make this part of what the Americans would call the general counsel's job, or in our, in our sort of jargon, the company secretary. Because he's the guy who does legal risks. So he's the guy who says, you know, we can't do this because you may end up in an orange jumpsuit in America. Something really bad can happen. You may end up with massive fines. And if you put the um, information security not as part of the IT function, but as part of the sort of compliance and legal function, then I think you can get some um, you can get some traction. The other problem is finding non-executive directors who really understand this stuff. Because in, in a well-run company, you have a dialogue between the hands-on executive directors who say, this is what we need to do, and then the non-executives who say, well, hang on, have you thought about X? And this is a very familiar thing in our culture. Now, we don't have, at the moment, the sort of people who can be non-executive directors in the field of information security. We have plenty of retired accountants who can be finance directors. We have engineers who can be, you know, talk about production. We have all sorts of you know, retired diplomats and politicians who talk about political risk. I don't think we yet have people um, who can come in up to at the board as a non-exec and then really ask the right questions of the CISO, even assuming you've got a CISO and he's working in the general counsel's office with the authority to make things happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Adam, you know, there is a lot of focus on prevention. We hear about lots of, you know, high profile hacks, you know, Sony, Ashley Madison, you know, these are things that grab headlines uh, and make people be aware of prevention. Um, but how important is it for us to be thinking beyond that into the realm of detection and response now? And how can companies prepare themselves for an attack if it happens? OK, so so on the detection side, um, there are relatively few companies, even those who have firewalls, various levels of security, who actually actively monitor those and have any protective monitoring in place that says, hey, we've seen something slightly different, doesn't look like a normal scripted attack, maybe we should have a look at it a little bit more. So that's that's one side that, that's, 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 a, that's an awareness thing and also a resource thing. Um, but the the um, the response side to 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 any kind of incident is something that we should all be aware of, and this is something that it may not even be um, your own systems that get compromised that cause you to need to respond to to your stakeholders, your data stakeholders. So with with the advent of big data, for example, it may be that there's there's certain data that's anonymized and shared um, by by others, uh, which which is which has a relation to to some of your data. It may be that another party also has some other data which is anonymized. The two pieces of data in isolation are are perfectly benign and harmless, but as the amount of big data um, that's being shared across the whole planet um, uh, increases, then it doesn't take a lot of work to start to put this data together and actually. Um, Reattribute the data to individual persons if they, if they can find a common key, whether it's a MAC address, an IP address, a postcode, or whatever. And suddenly, you've had a data compromise that isn't due to your lack of diligence, but you still need to respond. So, so being being able to um, being able to respond in the right way that inspires confidence uh, and not bury your head in the sand is is a very very important because. At the end of the day, you're going to have to have a long-term relationship with all these customers, and you want them to stay as your customers, and you want them to understand that you've done the best job that you can. And if, and also that that um, that that um, being able to prove that uh, an issue like that wasn't, for example, caused by you, but it was caused by other other parties, is also important. So, so the the human element of it is 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 paramount, and and also just whilst on the human element. Um, we mentioned the, um, the the need for board level representation for for security within a company, but that has to echo down as a culture um, throughout the entire company, and it almost comes down to the, the why we shred our documents, uh, why we lock the front door, um, why we lock our cars, and that it has to echo across everything, um, and that and that's something that also starts to create that questioning culture for all other aspects of, of people's actions. 
Mm. I noticed Jennifer dropped off the call for a moment there. I hope you, it wasn't a DDoS attack on you, my dear. <laughs> um, did, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, um, Edward, the, the um, you know, it does seem to be about education. It does seem to be about you know the knowledge um, at being there and, and that giving you the fundamental tools to be able to start to act on it. Um, Last week at this conference, um, the, the summit, uh, Ed Vasey announced the um, uh, cyber uh, security health check. Um, you know, the, the latest information breaches, uh, security breaches survey said 80% of all attacks could have been avoided um, last year. Um, do you think that this is going to go far enough to help educate businesses? Well, I think we've got to stop thinking that there's a single magic bullet. There's no, ne there's no sufficient conditions for this. There's just lots of necessary ones. And yes, education is very important. But one thing we haven't talked about so far is following the money, going after the bad guys, and raising their cost of doing business. And one of the things that really strikes me is we have something like £80 billion a year um, going into the criminal economy as a result of cyber attacks, or cyber, cyber crime in this country. Well, laundering $80 billion a year is really quite difficult. You can do that by um, aggregating it in bank accounts and then transferring it abroad, but then you've got to open the bank accounts. There'll be some kind of know your customer check done then. The money will flow to these sort of collection accounts where you transfer it to you know, Moldova or Russia or China or wherever. Well, that also involves someone having to give a decision, an you know, authenticated decision to the bank, or maybe you put it all on um, in an internet casino, but then you can go to the internet casino and say, you're doing your KYC check. And, and it seems to me that our police are just completely swamped by this. They aren't following up. Um, this money trail, and if we did that, we could start um, doing more to go after these people. Now, sometimes yeah, they're in remote jurisdictions where we have no ability to get at them, but not always. You know, the Talk Talk um, attack was done by a couple of teenagers in Northern Ireland, so that was kind of easy. But at the moment, I think there's almost a climate of impunity um, for cyber criminals. They don't have to worry about getting caught. They ought to worry. We could make life a lot more difficult for them. It wouldn't deter them completely. Um, but I think that you know, these, the, 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 the police, both in terms of what they do in the UK and within the European Union, um, which is, I think is our best hope of dealing with this, and also transatlantic cooperation with the FBI, we ought to be able to do some stuff here. They're not going to invest their money, in the end of the day, in Kazakhstan. They're going to invest their money in rich countries where it's safe. And if they want to do that, we have a chance of getting back at them. Well, this is, I mean, this is a good point, actually, as well. You know, the uh, I mentioned the, 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 the spoofing website, you know, coming from Czechoslovakia, and, you know, a lot of um, uh, attacks come from other countries. Is there an element of the cross-border jurisdiction actually being a major roadblock to us being able to, to um, follow through uh, with legal action? Yes, absolutely. But it's, it's not an insuperable one. We're used to things like, you know, the international maritime law, is actually quite good at dealing with a ship which is owned by one person, chartered by another, in a third country, with a crew from a fourth country, the captain's from a fifth country, and they do something bad. And we, you know, we've worked out how to do that with ships. It's complicated, and it you know, makes lots of money for laws, but we can do that. We do that with aviation. You, you, have, you couldn't run a, a country, couldn't run a sort of major international hijacking racket without getting some um, very, seri very serious problems. So I think the, the cross-border stuff is absolutely crucial. We, we've got to understand that the internet crosses borders. Electrons can move around the world pretty much at the speed of light. And that means the money moves with them and the attackers can do that. So we, we've got to get, we, but we, we sort of know how to do this. It's just we're not doing it. It gets back to the pain threshold. If you had $80 billion a year being stolen from British households by men with guns, put on cars and then driven to another country, you'd find the public and the police and the politicians were all taking this as a really serious um, thing. At the moment, the same amount of money is going via electrons and people still think, oh, well, I don't really understand that. How does it work? That's it. And, you know, uh, the other thing that um, Ed Vasey announced was that they're going to be uh, putting, earmarking another two billion uh, in funds to tackle cyber security. Um, so, you know, so hopefully, um, you know, sort of some of that will be will, will be pushed towards uh, um, detection and, and bringing criminals to justice. We're, time is ripping by, so I'm going to move on to the third point, um, plugging the skills gap. Uh, as I mentioned at the start of the show, there are around, currently, around a million unfilled jobs in cyber security. Um, the UK should, uh, in the UK here, security jobs make up around 
14% of the advertised vacancies in the digital sector at the moment. And yet, you know, we, we've heard from the Chamber of Commerce survey um, uh, just recently, one in four businesses struggle to find enough digitally skilled workers across the board. You know, Jennifer, you're working in, you know, in, in the field of trying to educate people, trying to encourage more people to think about this. Um, what can and is being done to um, foster the next generation of cyber professionals, and is it enough? Right. It's a really good question, and this is where I'm going to get kind of controversial here. We're teaching kids as young as five to co read code. By age eight, they're writing code, and I've seen, you know, with the National Crimes Agency over the last year, the, the growing massive problem of kids as early as nine exploiting code. So if we don't do something to address those skills, but equally, this is a big reason why we, we launched Hacker House. It, we're not making the world a better place throwing these kids behind bars. You know, you can't hire a nine-year-old any more than you can throw them in jail. And, and while I am definitely not condoning criminality, and I'm not saying it's okay to break the law, there's two different issues here of, of trespassing and exploiting and fraud and commercializing crime. Um, but there's also a huge opportunity of aggregating skill to then teach and empower and inspire other skill. And I've seen it for the last year and a half in my house, like with what I've what I've done with these kids. So, um, UK has all the opportunity. We can we've shown that we've got you know uh, the ability to mandate coding in a classroom. You know, in the last few years, we've completely turned away around the uh, national curriculum, and that's amazing. Next step we need to take is you know to make people aware of what you know is happening. When I go and I speak uh, in a classroom of 30 kids, I speed date them all, and I can tell right away which ones have already dabbled in what we call black hat hacking. And rather than freak out and bark at them about all the you know potential crimes they're going to commit, I asked them if I could talk to them after class and I explained to them, you know, how easy it is to dabble in, you know, black hat hacking and try to teach it or approach it in a way that then empowers them to actually use this skill for good. And if we can get more initiatives like Hacker House around, you know, as a place to aggregate where skills can come and, you know, use their talent for good, but also then teach others, oh, we'll be in such a better place. And, and, and this is where I really continue to push not only executive training and startup boot camps and, and, and hackathons the whole bit, but start them as early as, as uh, you know, nine, ten years old. That's actually a big reason why I went on the mayoral trip recently uh, with the mayor of London over to Israel. Because they, I mean, no one does security better than these guys. And I was just blown away with the programs that they have, um, particularly for the ages of 12 to 15 years old, and then 16 to 18. And then while in that country they do enter a military, obligatory military service, in this country and in the U.S., they could be entering startup accelerators and, you know, cohorts that celebrate entrepreneurship, which is what they do anyways. So I know that National Crimes Agency has this big problem, and their focus is 12 to 15-year-olds uh, for this prevention piece. So I'd love to now tie in, and as many, you know, people that we can spread the word with, with, to tie all these great initiatives together and say, right, you know, we have this massive burgeoning skill set. I think it's like 300,000 jobs now. You know, currently it'd be slated over 5 million in the next five years. It's only going to get worse. Let's do something now. Yeah, absolutely. And Adam, you know, this was one of the one of the things that um, the government said that they were focusing on as well. Is and it sounds a bit like a the script for a Hollywood movie, but you know, focusing on that um, uh, on recognizing um, certain skill sets in young people and then um, helping them to use those to 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 move forward into positive uh, careers. And actually, when I, I speak quite a lot at education events and and to, to to young people at schools, and you know, it's potentially a real Really good career. You know, you can work anywhere in the world, and you can pretty much write your own paycheck if you if you're extremely good at it. Um, do you think this is the right sort of focus for us to be looking at? It is. Um, so, so yeah, I, I I was at the Chancellor's announcement um, when he announced the, the 1.9 billion, and it was it was clear there was a focus on I think they said 14 to 17 year olds. Um, I, I agree with Jennifer that may be slightly too old, um, but it. It is, it is something where you're, you're looking for acumen at a very, very early age, and it's the acumen to learn and to self-teach because the internet is, a, is an evolving thing. Um, so, so 
you're having to relearn and evolve those skills almost every day. And you're not targeting really um, what would be computing students at university. You're targeting people with a particular set of skills, a particular logical reasoning, uh, and a particular acumen. And it's really, really important to, 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 to grab them early uh, and give them an outlet uh, for, for, those, for those skills. Um, because otherwise, um, yep, they can be dangerous. Mm. Um, and, and, these, and these skills can be used to do some pretty awesome things. And as, as, a, as a governor of um, the college in Leeds, we have 48,500 students. And there's, there's, um, when I talk to those students, I, I bring them in, in in batches to tell them how the internet works. Um, we, we have interest in the cyber element with, 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 from students who could be in uh, music technology, uh, or in, uh, in, the cr in creative technologies, but not, not pure computing. Uh, it's, it's all the different peripheries. So, so we, we do need to kind of foster those skills and support those people from, a, from an early age. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm looking at the time. This has been so fascinating. The time has absolutely disappeared. Um, I think somebody's <laughs> packing my clock, maybe. I'm not sure. <laughs> but listen, I just would like to very, very quickly, if you could all run down the line. I'll start with you, Edward, um, then we'll go to Jennifer and we'll come back to Adam. What is your top line that you would like people to take away from today and perhaps go and act on? Um, Edward. Well, I think for everybody who understands this thing, the most important um, lesson and point is to stop using jargon. You know, we, <laughs> one, of the, one of the things about when you learn about computers is you start understanding what TCP IP means and SSL and DDoS and all this stuff, and it's it's a tremendously useful shorthand. And when I'm talking to my friends like Jennifer, you know, we can talk in fluent geek, and that's absolutely fine. But nobody <laughs> else understands this stuff. If you're talking about road safety, you don't go on about gudgeon pins and gaskets. You say that if you drive your car too fast, it becomes a lethal weapon. And you, we, we, we've solved the road safety problem, we've solved public hygiene largely in the West by simple messages. You don't have to be an epidemiologist to understand that coughs and sneezes spread diseases and that spitting in the street isn't cool. And so I think we, for, for, for those of us who are, as, if, as, as it were, on the inside, we've got to stop using jargon and speak normal English that normal people understand. That's the first thing. The second thing is that anyone who's in a decision-making position outside the kind of geek space has got to start thinking, what do I do to keep the data safe that I'm responsible for? That may be my suppliers' data, it may be my employees' data, it may be my customers' data, it may be my business's data, it may be other data that, I, that has been entrusted to me. But that is my responsibility. I have a personal moral responsibility for that, and I've got to discharge that. I should be staying awake at night worrying about it if it's not safe. Is it encrypted? Have I hashed and sorted all the passwords that I'm responsible for? And I think that will begin to change the culture. The final thing is we should all accept it's going to get worse before it gets better. The worst is yet to come. That's a cheery note. On that cheery note, we'll move, we'll move on to Jennifer. Your top line, please. Not all hackers are bad. There's not one size fits all, and stop making the media portray them as these, you know, guys with hoodies, like the proverbial like basement dwelling um, kids. I think 90% of the kids that are arrested for hacking realize if they could just give use their skill for someplace good, they would have done so and much prefer so uh, to do so. Um, equally, the uh, opportunity that they could make on the good side of the law versus the bad side far outweighs it. So we need to stop making it seem like all hackers are bad. Demonizing computing skills. Um, Adam, your top line, please. Um, I think no, nobody is an expert in this subject. It's it's such a wide subject um, that no, no nobody is is immune to this. Um, it's it's about starting at at your level and and working up. Um, and 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 expanding your knowledge, but you, it's it's a case of starting. So, I believe CISP is a good way to start because you you can reach out to organisations which could be very experienced, but you could also reach out to organisations which could be of a similar level and could be experiencing similar problems, and they can also vocalise those in a way how how it's impacted them in 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 a non jargon um, related way. And there is a lot of jargon. Uh, in this industry, uh, we've talked about ports. We've we've talked about salts. Uh, we've talked about encryption. 
and all those have massive vertical levels of expertise uh, and that can also alienate a lot of businesses from actually even reaching out because as soon as you look at some of this stuff you think ah, new scary language I'll back away and that's that's the worst thing that could happen so it's a case of start at your level move at your own pace and that's 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 all you can do Right, brilliant. Well, it's been absolutely fascinating, and you know, and I think we've we've got under the skin of some really important issues here. Um, thank you so much to my amazing guests, to Edward, Adam, and Jennifer. Um, uh, head along to CISP. Sign up at CISP. Um, Edward, hold up your book. Read Edward's book. <laughs> and go along and join Jennifer on one of her her hack. Um, in uh, innovation tech innovate, uh, innovation um, uh, sessions uh, events um, we'll put all of the website details and everything that you need to go along and um, join our speakers in the show notes underneath so if you're watching this later on um, on YouTube um, then you should be able to just click on those links um, that is unfortunately all we have time for today my thanks to my wonderful guests for sharing their insights and to you for watching and joining in with your questions which um, hopefully we'll have some questions fed in through Twitter keep talking about it use the hashtag um, hashtag digileaders um, and keep up to date with us uh, follow the follow the digileaders account and we will be able to let you about plans for the know about plans for the next episode um, in the meantime don't be too worried don't lose any sleep over it until next time stay connected